for them outside. So, for Innistrad Midnight Hunt, let's look at the white cards. The first card we have here is a commander. Adeline Resplendent Cathar. Legendary creature, human knight. One and two white. Uh, it's a blank four. It has vigilance. Adeline Resplendent Cathar's power is equal to the number of creatures you control. So she's like the leader of an army, and the more creatures you have, the more powerful she becomes. When, whenever you attack, for each opponent, create a 1-1 one, one white human creature token that's tapped and attacking that player or a planeswalker. Attacking that player or a planeswalker they control. So most of the time when you create uh, a tapped and attacking creature, you don't get to choose... A different target but in this case you can choose uh, to send that white knight to towards a planeswalker if you if they have one otherwise it's attacking the player and so that's pretty crazy um, her power is equal to the number of creatures you control so because it doesn't specify non token creatures every time you create one of these white human creature tokens her power goes up so if they don't die um, during the combat phase and you're building, slowly building and building and building this collection of 1-1 one, one white knight creature tokens, then as you go along, as you go through turns, Adeline becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. This is a very dangerous card and it's only three mana to cast it. <clears throat> I think as much as commander decks aren't necessarily built around a single color, this is a very scary commander. Um, if you're playing a mono white, very, very scary. Especially if you're playing a full game of commander with four players or six players. Um, that means every time um, you attack, you get to create four human creature tokens or three human creature tokens instead of uh, just the one if you were playing this solo. So that's pretty crazy. The next white card we have is Blessed Defiance. For one white, it's an instant. Target creature you control gets plus two, plus zero, and gains lifelink until end of turn. When that creature dies this turn, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. So, you could cast this um, at instant speed. So, you could cast a... Bless Defiance on top of one of these white human creature tokens that Adeline creates. And once that, um, if that human creature token dies, it will come back as a spirit token. You can maintain Adeline's strength um, for the next turn, which is pretty crazy. It's, a, it's one white for a plus two gains lifelink. It's pretty standard. As far as the buff goes, I think the um, the biggest benefit for the Blessed Defiance is the when the creature dies, create a 1-1 one, one spirit token. It's kind of like um, Feign Death or some of these other cards that have um, come out in the D&D &D set where we are casting instants on creatures that are going to die in order to keep them alive or bring them back to the battlefield. Um, this is very much on the same train as those cards. I feel, I feel very odd right now. Physically. I feel physically odd. Um, the next card we have is Borrowed Time. It's two and a white for an enchantment. When Borrowed Time enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Borrowed Time leaves the battlefield. So it's basically a port hole, a portable hole from the D&D &D set, except for um, it's three mana instead of just the one mana. Um, and basically you're just freezing out a creature or non-land permanent the opponent controls. Uh, maybe Porthole actually, if Porthole is, uh, 
I don't remember the exact verbiage on Portable Hole. When Portable Hole enters the battlefield, exile non-target, non-land permanent, and opponent controls. Oh, okay, so Portable Hole has a mana cap, so a mana value 2 or less, whereas Borrowed Time is the same function, except for it's 2 mana more to cast, um, and it has no mana cap, so you can cast it on anything, which is really great. Uh, the next card is Candle Grove Witch, which is one and a white for a 2-2 two -two, uh, human warlock creature with Coven. At the beginning of your combat on your turn, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, Candle Grove Witch gains flying until end of turn. So that 2-2 two -two becomes a 2-2 two -two with flying, uh, assuming you have Coven, which is something we're going to be building a lot around. I think I said it last week when I did the preview. Uh, card analysis. I think Coven is a far more practical um, and controllable version of the party mechanic, where the party mechanic you had to have a wizard, a cleric, a rogue, and a warrior um, in order to have a full party. The Coven mechanic is a little more broad. All you have to do is have three or more creatures with different powers. Um, the toughness doesn't matter, it's just the power. Um, so Candle Grove Witch counts as one of those creatures. If you have two other creatures on your battlefield, and as long as none of the other two have two power, and the other two have different powers, then you get your Coven ability, which gives the Candle Grove Witch flying until end of turn. Um, this is something to consider as well when you're considering which creatures to buff. Um, it kind of is, is an interesting way that Wizards has designed um, the idea that buffing one creature might not be the best uh, case scenario, the best use of your spells. Instead, you might want to balance things out and, and buff a creature here, buff a creature there, and kind of maintain a, an army of strong creatures rather than uh, just one buff creature. Because a lot of low level, low mana costing creatures have similar power levels. Speaking of candles, we have Candle Trap, which is a card we went over last week. Candle Trap is one white for an enchantment aura. Um, enchant creature, enchant creature has defender, meaning it can't attack. Uh, prevent all cam combat damage that would be dealt by enchanted creature. It also has Coven. Uh, this Coven ability is a mana ability, so if you have a Coven, which means three or more creatures with different toughness, then you can pay two in a white, and you can sacrifice Candle Trap, exile Enchanted Creature, activate only if you control three or more creatures with different powers. So, kind of like the... Um, let's see, the Gelatinous Cube... So Gelatinous Cube, when it enters the battlefield, you um, exile target creature with the Gelatinous Cube, and then you can pay X and Black to dissolve that creature and get them off the battlefield. Um, otherwise, when Gelatinous Cube dies, the, your opponent would get that creature back unless you dissolve it. So kind of a similar situation with Candle Trap, where um, you enchant a creature, it becomes a defender, so it can't attack. And then... If you have a coven and you pay two and a white, you can sacrifice Candle Trap and it will exile the creature that has been enchanted by it. This is fantastic. It's a nice setup. It costs one to cast Candle Trap, which is very cheap. Um, there's no mana, um, no mana restriction on what you can target with Candle Trap, and basically, it's not. It's not a, an end-all, be-all for the player that is being trapped in this scenario. If, if one of my... ...much mana your opponent has, whoever casted Candle Trap, because as soon as they get to the three mana uh, window, you're going to be worried about your 
creature that is um, enchanted. So you have you have a brief window, assuming that they cast Candle Trap early. You have a brief window to uh, remove the enchantment and save your creature. The next card is Cathar Commando. One and a white for a 3-1 human soldier creature with flash. This is interesting because white cards don't usually have flash. White creatures, I don't know if I've ever seen uh, Blink Dog, maybe, from the D&D set has flash. Um, I think it might actually just have double strike. Uh, it just has double strike. Um, so there's not a lot of flash creatures um, in white, and this is only two mana, so you can play it at any point that you can cast an instant on your opponent's turn, on your turn, um, after combat, um, after you've declared attackers. And then uh, they have an ability here. It's one mana, and you can sacrifice Cathar Commando and destroy target artifact or enchantment. This is big. Uh, this is very powerful. Um, I love cards that do this. There's a few cards in green that uh, sacrifice themselves to destroy target artifact or enchantment. Always put them in my decks, uh, and this is a great white version of that. So you pay one and a white to put com Cathar Commando out there at flash speed, and then you only pay one colorless mana to sacrifice commando to destroy enchantment or artifact great card love this card especially um as as we go through uh these cards a little bit more you're going to realize how much the white cards are geared towards humans and that's because a lot of the more powerful commanders um in innistrad for white uh, deal with humans directly. So there's a lot of human cards in white, and this is a very great one. The next card in white is Cathar's Call. It's two and a white for an enchantment aura. Enchant creature. Enchanted creature has vigilance, and at the beginning of your end step, create a 1-1 one, one white human creature token. So again, much like um, the resplendent, resplendent Cathar, this commander here, um, you want to enchant one of your creatures, you make a bunch of human creature tokens every time your commander attacks, or no, actually, whenever you attack. But whenever uh, you attack and Adeline is on the board, she gets tougher because she's making more humans, and then Cathar's Call will make more humans at your end step. Um, you're basically just trying to make a huge human army if you're playing white. And that's, that's the T. The next card we have is Celestis Sanctifier. Two and a white for a 3-2 human cleric creature, token, creature card. If it's neither day or night, it becomes day as Celestis Sanctifier enters the battlefield. So this is one of the white um, cards that starts the day-night cycles. When you start a game... Um, it's neither day nor night until one of these kind of cards enters the battlefield and makes it day or night. And then you follow the rules of the day-night cycles. So, whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, look at the top two cards of your library, put one of them into your graveyard. So, basically, you can um, set up the top deck and also set up your graveyard play with... Uh, the sanctifier here so the next white card we have is clarion cathars more cathars it's three and a white for a three three human knight creature when clarion cathars enters the battlefield create a one one white human creature token so once again uh these white cards are set up to create as many human creature tokens as possible because you're looking at a commander up here mono white commander that um, legendary creature that reacts her power is um, specifically determined by how many creatures you control so pump in the battlefield full of white human creature tokens is uh, something that a few of these cards have, are doing and 
therefore creating a more powerful legendary creature. The next card is Curse of Silence. It's one white for an aura curse. Enchant player. A Curse of Silence. As Curse of Silence enters the battlefield, choose a card name. Spells with the chosen name Enchantment Player Cast cost two more to cast. Whenever Enchanted Player casts a spell with the chosen name, you may sacrifice Curse of Silence if you do draw a card. So basically, you're forcing your opponent to play um, spells with, t with two more mana cost in their... Um, with, uh, you're forcing players to spend two more mana to cast specific spells. This is a, a card that's kind of like Pithing Needle, where you're naming cards that can't be used or have uh, dumbed down abilities. This is a card that's going to be very useful if you know the names of all the cards in your opponent's hands. I'm sure in Arena... Um, if you're playing Arena and play Curse of Silence, you will probably get a pop-up list of all the cards in your opponent's hands, and you'll just have to pick one. Kind of like when you play a uh, name creature type card, and it just shows you a list of all the creature types available um, in the game. Not, not in all of Magic, just specifically in your game. So this card will be a lot easier to play on Arena. It won't be as easy to play in real life unless you are playing in a tournament and it's an open deck list tournament where you have the opportunity to look at your opponent's deck list. The next card we have is Dual Craft Trainer. Dual Craft Trainer. Three and a white for a 3-3 three, three human soldier creature with first strike and it has a coven ability. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, target creature you control gains double strike until end of turn. So Dual Craft Trainer has first strike already, but you could also give it double strike if you have the Coven ability. Uh, this is a very good card, uh, pretty standard though, so it's not, uh, not something that's gonna swing the tides too much. It will probably get targeted pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. Interesting white card. The next card we have is Fateful Absence. It's one and a white for an instant. Destroy target creature or planeswalker. Its controller investigates. So investigating is when you create clue tokens. Um, and clue tokens, you have to pay two to sacrifice a clue to draw a card. Um, so... Destroy target creature or planeswalker. Great card, especially for one and a white. That's pretty cheap for destroy target creature. Um, and then to make it easier to swallow, if you're the one being targeted. Um, hold on one second. Um, so this is a very cheap destroy target creature or planeswalker. There's no mana cap, so you can destroy any target creature or planeswalker, um, that you're able to target with a spell. The, the way that Wizards has made it easier to swallow for those being targeted is that you get to create a clue token, which means you can pay two to draw a card. It's, it's all right. It's very good if you're the one casting this spell, um, but it's going to make a lot of people feel But This is a feels-bad card. Even if you get a clue token, still a feel-bad card. The next card we have here is um, Flare of Faith. It's one and a white for a instant. Target creature gets to plus two, plus two until end of turn. If it's a human, instead it gets three, three and gains indestructible until end of turn. So again, white leaning into that um, human 
uh, tribal kind of set. But because this is a largely werewolf set uh, in a Strad Midnight Hunt, you're going to see white leaning into the cleanliness and pureness of humans. Um, and so this card, having this card in your deck, it also benefits you to have humans uh, because it's a 2-2 buff that becomes a 3-3 buff plus indestructible if your target is a human. So that's just a good thing to have. The next card is Gavany Dawn's Guard, another card we went over last week. Uh, it's one and two whites for a 3-3 three, three human soldier creature with Ward 1, which means anytime this creature is the target of a spell, the caster of that spell has to pay one more mana. Um, if it's neither day nor night, it becomes day as Gavany Dawn's Guard enters the battlefield. Whenever day becomes night, or night becomes day, so whenever your day-night card flips over, uh, you may reveal a creature card. Oh, sorry, I missed a sentence. Whenever day becomes night, or night becomes day, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card with mana value three or less from among them, and put it into your hand, with the rest on the bottom of your library. So, oh, that's good. Uh, as long as you have Dawn's Guard on the battlefield, you can pick creature cards out of the top of your deck. Um, so this is not this is not the type of card you want to play early, because you want to mana ramp a bit first before you start throwing mana at the bottom of your library and pulling out creatures. Um, it is also mana capped at a value of three or more down here. So... You can only reveal creatures that have three or more values. So this is a, sort of like a middle of the game kind of card. You put Dawn's Guard down, and then every time it switches from day to night, you can look at the top four cards, potentially pull a creature card. You get a free creature card um, that you can cast either that turn or the next turn, whichever. <clears throat> so the next card we're looking at is Gavany Silversmith. It's three and a white for a 2-3 human soldier. When Gavany, <coughs> pardon me, when Gavany Silversmith enters the battlefield, put a 1-1 counter on each of up to two creature to creatures, two target creatures. So the Silversmith makes two other creatures, one stronger and one tougher. That's pretty good. It is four mana for a 2-3, so it's not a, a crazy um, card in and of itself. But if you've got some Coven cards on your battlefield and you need to change around some powers so that you can activate some Coven abilities, this is a very interesting card to play because you can choose very carefully where you put those 1-1 one, one counters. Um, so the next card we have is Gavany Trapper. What does Gavany mean? I'm going to look it up. Was it a place? Oh, it's a province. Oh, that makes sense. So this is Gavany Trapper. It's one white for a zero two human soldier. Um, and you pay two and tap him or her. Tap your trapper to tap target creature. So it traps another creature. Um, Gavany Trapper is very cheap with one mana. You need two mana to activate its ability, but you have to wait until it's a tap ability, so you can't use it right away. Um, so next turn, you can pay two and tap your trapper to tap an opponent's creature, essentially trapping them. It's very, very interesting. I like when Magic and the designers of Wizards of the Coast kind of give on-theme abilities, and it's something I'm sure that they spend a lot of time focusing on. The next card is Hedge Witch's Mask, and it's one white for an artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one. Equipped creature can't be blocked by creatures with power four or greater, and it has an equip cost of two. So you pay one to cast it, equip it for two, and it can't, it's basically a sneaking mask. Especially if you're playing against something like green, where there's a bunch of beefy creatures. 
um, putting a hedge witch's mask on something that has a, let's say, deal combat damage trigger, um, then you can get hedge witch's mask into the um, battlefield, equip it to a creature that you want to sneak through if the other battlefield is covered in large creatures. And then you get to sneak through and get that damage in. Plus, it's it gets a 1-1 buff. So it can't be blocked by creatures with power 4 or greater. The next card is Homestead Courage. It's 1 white for a sorcery. Put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. It gains vigilance until end of turn. And vigilance means when you attack, you don't tap. Um, so that that creature is still available for defense on your opponent's turn. Vigilance is a very great buff, and it's also um, very common in white. This card also has flashback for one, which means you can cast this card from your graveyard for its flashback cost. Then you have to exile it. So you can cast it once, put it in your graveyard, and later in the game cast it again for the same price. Usually the flashback cost is more expensive than the original casting cost, but this one is, it's basically just a sorcery you can use twice. You just can't ever use it again after that. So the next card is Intrepid Adversary. It's one and a white for a mythic 3-1 human scout. This creature has lifelink. Um, when Intrepid Adversary enters the battlefield, you may pay one and a white any number of times. When you pay this cost one or more times, put that many Valor counters on Intrepid Adversary. And creatures you control get plus one, plus one for each Valor counter on Intrepid Adversary. So this is a card that you want to play mid to late game. Preferably late game, because you can only add Valor counters to Intrepid Adversary when it enters the battlefield. And you can pay one and a white any number of times. So you want to, so you pay two to cast Trepid Adversary. Say you have 10 mana on board. The start of your turn, you cast Intrepid Adversary for two mana. So that leaves you with eight. And then you pay two mana four more times to use up all of your mana and put four adversary counters, or sorry, four valor counters on intrepid adversary. And then creatures you control get plus four, plus four, as long as intrepid adversary is still alive. And that includes this creature, because it says creatures you control, not other creatures you control. Then all of a sudden intrepid adversary becomes a seven five, and all of your other creatures are super buff. That's a pretty scary card. No wonder it's mythic. It's a rare. Quite a rare. Um, that's, that's pretty great. The art is really cool, too. I wish I could get a little bit closer on that. The next card is Loyal Griff, which looks like a swan slash um, pegasus. It's two and a white for a 2-2 two -two Hippogriff creature. It has flash and flying. So another flash creature for white, which is interesting. It has flying. When Loyal Griff enters the battlefield, you may return one other creature you control to its owner's... Wait. You may return another creature you control to its owner's hands. Oh. So this is an interesting one because there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of enter the battlefield mechanics that you want to repeat if you can. And Loyal Griff helps you repeat it by sending a creature card back to your hand. All right. So the next card is Audric's Outrider. It's three and a white for a 2-4 human knight creature token, creature card. Whenever Audric's Outrider or another creature you control dies, put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. So this is an interesting uh, counters buff where 
Having him on the battlefield will allow you to buff other creatures when your creatures dies. Um, or if he dies, then you can also put a 1-1 one, one counter on another creature. And it's 3 and a white for a 2-4 human knight. It's not too bad. The next card is Ritual Guardian. For 2 and a white, you get a 3-2 human soldier creature with Coven. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, Ritual Guardian gains lifelink until end of turn. That's pretty cool. So, Ritual Guardian is a lifelink creature as long as you have a coven, which is great. Three mana for a 3-2 with lifelink, if you play your cards right. The next card is Ritual of Hope. It's one and a white for an instant. Creatures you control get 1-1 one, one until end of turn. And it has Coven. If you control three or more creatures with different powers, creatures you control get plus two, plus one until end of turn instead. So this is the first instance of an instant with Coven um, abilities because that actually, wait, no, that was a human ability, not a Coven ability. Um, assuming you have a Coven and you maintain that Coven, you can... Give all of your creatures a plus two, plus one, instead of a plus one, plus one. Which is pretty great. The next white card is Search Party Captain. For three and a white, you get a 2-2 two, two human soldier creature. This spell costs one less to cast for each creature you attacked with this turn. So, if you don't play a lot of magic or you don't watch a lot of um, competitive magic... It is almost always the best, better bet to cast creatures after your combat on your turn, unless the creature, unless you need the creature's ability for combat. Always cast a creature after combat because it's going to have summoning sickness, so it's going to be useless. Um, and this this party captain, search party captain, costs one mana less for each creature you attacked with this turn, so it's advertising and suggesting that you cast him after combat because then you can make it cheaper um when search party captain enters the battlefield draw a card it's pretty pretty straightforward pretty simple um i like that then we've got uh Sigarda splendor so Sigarda is one of the big mythical champions for innistrad the Plane of Innistrad, and Innistrad Midnight Hunt specifically. We will get to her later. Um, this is a two and a white white for an enchantment. As Sigarda's Splendor enters the battlefield, note your life total. This is an interesting wording here. So, take note of your life total. At the beginning of your upkeep, draw a card if your life total is greater than or equal to the last noted life total for Sigarda's Splendor. Then, note your life total. Whenever you cast a white spell, you gain one life. So. Basically, this is going to reward you. But whenever you cast a white spell, you gain a life. Boom. Instant reward. That's a great enchantment already. Because you're going to be casting a lot of white spells. Um, but this is also going to reward you if your life total is more or equal to the last noted life total. So as long as you keep casting white spells and you keep maintaining um, your health and avoid taking damage and going below your last noted life total, you get to draw an extra card at the beginning of your turn, which is fantastic. Uh, the next card is Sigardian Savior. This is another mythic rare. For three, a white and a white, you get a 3-3 three, three angel t creature with flying. When Sigardian Savior enters the battlefield, if you cast it, return up to two target creature cards with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So for five mana, you get to return two creature cards to your battlefield, and you get a 3-3 three, three angel creature. Granted, they have to be small creatures because it's mana value two or less. But there's some pretty great um, two or fewer mana creatures, like Intrepid Adva Adversary. 
that mythic works really well for this mythic. Actually, you know what? I'm going to save those. Because that is a pretty great um, combo. Those two work very, very well together. The next card is Soul Guide Griff, another Hippogriff. For four and a white, you get a 3-4 Hippogriff Spirit with flying. When Soul Guide Griff enters the battlefield, exile up to one target creature card from a graveyard. So this is nice to control other players and their graveyards. If you don't like a card and you're worried about their ability to um, retain that card from a graveyard or cast it from a graveyard, you can exile it with uh, Soul Guide Griff and you won't have to worry about it anymore. And you get a 3-4 flying creature. The next card is Sun Gold Barrage. For two and a white, you get an instant. Destroy target creature with toughness four or greater. So this is another classic kind of white card. Destroy a powerful target creature. Um, my partner plays a lot of white cards, and this shit is annoying as hell. You work so hard to get out big buff creatures or buff your tiny creatures, and then all of a sudden, it's just gone. Um, so that's a pretty standard white card, just remade kind of for Innistrad Midnight Hunt. The next card is Sun Gold Sentinel. For one and a white, you get a 3 2 human soldier. That's pretty good. 3 2. For only two mana. Whenever Sun Gold Sentinel enters the battlefield or attacks, exile up to one target card from a graveyard. So, again, like the Hippogriff Spirit up here, this is exiling graveyard cards. Pretty powerful tool, especially if you're playing against uh, an opponent with a lot of graveyard play. Uh, it also has a Coven ability. For one and a white, choose a color. Sun Gold Sentinel gains Hexproof from that color until end of turn and can't be blocked by creatures of that color this turn. Activate only if you control three or more creatures with different powers. That's pretty cool. If you're playing against a black or a green deck, you pay one and a white and choose green. Um, then they can't cast spells against green or against your Sun Gold Sentinel in green. They also can't block with green creatures, which is pretty cool. The next card is Sunset Revelry. Again, the Innistrad Midnight Hunt is kind of surrounding this fall festival party. Um, coven thing so this has got some art that portrays like a little party going on here or a ritual um, it's one and a white for a sorcery if an opponent has more life than you gain four life if an opponent controls more creatures than you create two one one white human creature tokens if an opponent has more cards in hand than you draw a card so for two mana you could essentially if all these things are true you could gain four life, get two creatures, and draw a card for two mana. That is bonkers. That is bonkers. I'm putting that on my top five list as of right now. Might change. The next white card is Thraben Exorcism. Or, oh, it's Kaya. That's dope. Uh, she's from Caltime. Uh, Thraben Exorcism. For one and a white, you get an instant. Exile target spirit. Creature with disturb or enchantment. So this is very good because, um, there's a lot of cards that have a disturb cost, which brings them back to life from the graveyard in a, in a flipped form. So whatever their backside form is, which is generally more powerful than the original form. So... This Thraben Exorcism lets you exile a spirit or a creature with Disturb or an enchantment. It's great. That way people can't use those uh, really powerful Disturb cards. The next card is Unruly Mob. For one and a white, you get a 1-1 one, one human creature. Whenever another creature you control dies, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Unruly Mob. Um, nicely. This card does not say non-token creature. So that means all of these white human tokens you've been making, anytime any one of those dies, it, this unruly mob becomes more powerful because 
as people in your town die, the unruly mob is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually it's unstoppable. Um, the last white card on this list is Vanquish the Horde. For six, a white and a white, so eight mana total. You get a sorcery. This spell costs one less to cast for each creature on the battlefield. Not on your battlefield, just on all, all battlefields. And this sorcery destroys all creatures. That is a really good way to end the white list. Uh, a destroy all creatures spell that costs one less for each creature on the battlefield you're about to destroy. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. Um, so before we go on to blue, I'm just going to 